As I mentioned, we've just for a few semesters been having a book of the semester. Previous books have included The, the Paradox of American Power by Joseph Nye of the Kennedy School of Government. Last semester, Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond. And this semester brings us to uh, Professor Jean Bethke Elstein's book, Just War Against Terror, The Burden of American Power in a Violent World. Uh, in a number of events that we've organized here, we've noted that uh, it's been a little bit difficult finding uh, experts on just war theory, although I understand there uh, are a number here on campus. We were also sort of interested in uh, an approach to a very uh, important and timely issue, uh, the war on terror, terrorism, and just war theory, uh, coming from a professor of social and, and uh, a professor of ethics from the University of Chicago. Uh, Jean Bethke Elstein is the Laura Spellman Rockefeller Professor of Social and Political Ethics. Well, she's published over 400 essays in scholarly journals and journals of civic opinion that deal with topics in the area of political philosophy, ethics, and social theory. And as many have noted in book reviews and uh, commentaries, she is a public intellectual of the highest order. Um, just quickly, the New York Times Book Review noted that in this book in particular, that Elstein notes an, an inability to make the right distinctions between, for instance, martyrs and murderers, or between justice and revenge, or between terror and legitimate war. She notices what she calls a, quote, false clarity derived from false analogies. For instance, a comparison of political repression today to that of the Palmer raids after World War I, or the internment of over 100,000 Japanese Americans during World War II. Uh, Elstein also points out that in many discussions in universities and churches across the United States, quote, repeatedly, the worst possible gloss is put on American motivation and the best possible gloss on the motivations of those who have attacked us. And in this manner, not afraid to make a bit of noise, Elstein sends her arguments rolling across the lawn everywhere, encountering weedy clumps of prejudice and ill-conceived assumptions, and everywhere leaving behind a well-trimmed swath of intellectual clarity, which is pleasing to see, according to one reviewer. We'll see if these uh, assertions hold up today. We've assembled a distinguished panel of faculty members from BYU. Uh, just briefly to introduce on my right, far right, Professor Sally Barlow, Professor of Psychology, Professor Brian Howwood, Professor of Ancient Scripture, Valerie Hudson, Professor of Political Science on my left, and on my far left, John Tanner, Professor of English. The format today will be such that each panelists, beginning with uh, Professor Barlow, will be given five to seven minutes to make an opening statement. You're welcome to do it here at the podium if they, if they like. Uh, after each faculty member has had a chance to uh, make their statement, uh, we will have responses among the faculty panel to one another. And uh, when we reach a point that uh, seems, uh, seems right, we'll move to uh, questions from the audience. So uh, we, we would like to begin then with Professor Barlow. Um, I'm going to reduce this book, this really quite fine, very well written book, to about four sentences. This is her treatise. September 11th was an act of terror. Our freedom as Americans is at stake, and we are justified to preserve our freedom, not to enact revenge. Both the academy and the pulpit have responded mostly as pseudo-pacifists, and she believes that Niebuhr and Tillich have the right stance, and these are two of my very favorite philosophers. And um, she believes that the nation of Islam and Christianity, and the very statement of that, the nation of Islam and Christianity, view the world very differently as they do the definitions of peace, just, and unjust wars. And um, I, uh, in order for you to, to believe some of what I say, I'm supposed to establish myself as an expert. I write in peacemaking journals. Uh, colleagues and I have been training children with uh, peacemaking skills. Um, I present at national and international conferences on terror and terrorism. Um, but my heart really is with working with children who have wa watched or witnessed uh, abuse. And we're in a 12-week program. We teach them how to negotiate. Um, we teach them really good peacemaking skills. Okay, so I have three worldviews. My first worldview, which is most comprehensive to me, is my religion. And I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I am constantly reminded to seek the peaceable things of the kingdom. 
My second worldview is uh, as an American, a citizen of the United States, and the Constitution means a lot to me. I really believe in the division of church and state and the Bill of Rights and the Article One of the Bill of Rights. And probably most personally, and last, I am a psychologist. I believe I work wet the best with people one-on-one -on -one or in small groups, which is another area of my expertise, group process and outcome research and group psychotherapy. Um, I really believe that peace comes from within the individual, though I'm not naive. I'm not naive enough to assume that contexts don't in some way impinge upon individuals' rights to be free, peaceful, just, that kind of stuff. Uh, we all have midbrains and we all have amygdalas and we must all tame our own angry impulses. So the instinct, well, we don't really have an instinct for peace. We certainly have an instinct for aggression and anger and we must learn a response to that. Um, I am mostly persuaded by my religion. Pehoran says to Moroni in Alma 61, Therefore, my beloved brother, Moroni, let us resist evil, and whatsoever evil we cannot resist with words. Yea, such as rebellions and dissensions, let us resist them without swords, that we may retain our freedom, that we may rejoice in the great, oh, sorry, with swords, that we may retain our freedom. That's a really, that's, that's the trouble here. That's my unconscious speaking. No, 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 no war, never war. Okay. With swords, that we may retain our freedom, that we may rejoice in the great privilege of our church and in the cause of our Redeemer and our God. Therefore, come unto me speedily with a few of your men and leave the remainder in charge of Lehi and Teacum. Give unto them power to conduct the war in that part of the land according to the spirit of God, which is also the spirit of freedom which is in them. And the only leader of war that I would ever support, behold, I, Moroni, your chief captain, I seek not for power, but to pull it down. I seek not for honor of the world, but for the glory of my God and the freedom and welfare of my country. I am representing Bonnie Bell of Spanville and all my colleagues at the Women's Research Institute. And we are a peaceable research institute and believe foremost in peace. I must say that I was persuaded by her book. She quoted all my favorite authors, all of them. She clearly was as much moved and shaped by Albert Camus as I was. There are two responses to this book. When I showed it to my clinical psych supervision group just before I came here, they said, just war, as in, oh, oh, just a war. It's just a war. And I said, no, well, let's adjust war. Oh. And I think that's actually the dilemma we have before us. I might just say, say at the outset that the uh, Nation of Islam is uh, headed by Louis Farrakhan, <laughs> just so you remember. Um, let me just read from my perspective uh, about this book. Uh, I had to write these thoughts down so I could make sure I said it just the way I want to say it here. Uh, I hope I do okay. Jean L. Stain's Just War Against Terror is a well-written, intelligent, thoughtful, and at times provocative foray into the justification for war. It's an emotional book as well. It's written about a year or so after the horrific events of September 11th. Elstein, Elstein tugs at the heartstrings as she lays the foundation of the book with a trenchant reminder of the occurrences of that fateful day. I could sense Elstein's anger, grief, pain, and hurt throughout the book. I felt in my reading Elstein was tempted to say, this one event is enough to justify the response of war. What, in, what need is there to argue the point further? From an emotional perspective, this isn't difficult to understand. But I'd like to take the approach as a religion professor with a background in Arabic and Islamic studies, if I might. As I read the book, I kept wondering if the book is properly titled with its sole emphasis on Islamic extremism or Islamism. I thought it should perhaps be titled something like just war against Islamism, or just war against terror, colon, the burden of American power within a radically Islamic environment. Elstein rightly, albeit infrequently, acknowledges that Islamists have hijacked Islam, and that the majority of the 1.2 billion Muslims are like us, very family-oriented people who go to work, school, and sincerely try to live their religion. However, 
If a moderate Muslim were to read this book, I wonder what the response would be to Elstein's sole focus on Islamism as the seeming culprit in terrorist activity. Is, Islamist, is Islamism the, the case study here? Or does Elstein believe that Islamists represent the vanguard of Huntington's inevitable clash of civilizations? I'm unsure. Terrorism, as discussed in the book, is the spreading of fear and the random murder of innocent people. Elstein does a good job of showing contrast between terrorists and soldiers, collateral damage and gratuitous death, justice and revenge, the rules of a just, limited war, and indiscriminate killing. She takes the academy and the clergy to task for questioning the rightness of this war against terror. In essence, she defends the Bush administration's doctrine of preemption. Elstein gives evidence of the just war in her discussion of the removal of the Taliban from Afghanistan. Of course, the final chapter of this story is yet to be written. One concern I have with the general definition of terrorism put forth in this book is that it fails to discriminate t differences in terrorist activity. In the Middle East, for example, are the motivations to do terrorist, terrorist activities different from one region to another? I believe so. It's my view that the rationale of a suicide bomber in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict differs considerably from that of an Al-Qaeda adherent. The former perceives his situation from the point of despair of living in occupation under an oppressive government backed by the USA, while the latter is more likely to be an educated Islamist ideologue who views the US as another colonial empire pushing its corrupted culture, politics, and religion upon Islam. Would a careful analysis of terrorist motivations help to refine foreign policy? Should the US deal with terrorism in Israel in precisely the same way as it does terrorism in Ethiopia or London or anywhere else? We may have the biggest hammer in the world, but without careful analysis of the finer points in this conflict, we may end up using the hammer blindfolded or at least with no peripheral vision. I think just war against terror in general articulates very well what's at stake and argues persuasively for military action. Elstein's cogent example of the silence of the intellectuals during the rise of Hitler's Hitler seems to forcibly hit the heart of the matter. It is interesting that on more than one occasion I've heard Islamists compared to Nazis. I even heard that it was said in a fast and testimony meeting. <laughs> is this a fair comparison? Certainly Islamists represent an evil we have heretofore never imagined. Should the US identify and attack every conceivable Islamist stronghold. In principle, I believe that if we have the correct intelligence and can launch a limited engagement to root them out, it should be done. However, in my view, for this to be a just war, it must be a smart war. I do not disagree with Elstein in, in some ways that Bush has been, to some degree, unjustly described as generating cowboy politics. I believe he is sincere in his intentions to quash terrorism wherever it appears. In other words, I think this is going to be a long and complicated war. It will take some real and accurate intelligence to re re wage it successfully. Elstein shows some signs of being outside her field when it comes to her understanding the Islamist, Muslim, and especially Arab mindset. Most Arab Muslims really do remember the Crusades like it was yesterday. It really does play into their religious views. What I seemed to notice as I went further and further into Elstein's arguments was that she seemed to look at Islam from a Christian perspective. This caused her arguments to take on a consistently Christian hue. By the end of the book, it appeared to me the real solution to terrorism or Islamism in Elstein's view is the Christian approach to democracy in the United States. This produced, perhaps unwittingly, a dichotomy of possible conflict between Islam and Christianity. This implies that Islam cannot provide any substantive assistance in the war against terror. Perhaps Elstein is frustrated from the silence of the moderate Muslims who may be afraid to speak up because of reprisals from terrorists or, or who can't get the airtime for lack of ratings. Of course, those versed in, in Islamic studies know the teachings of the Quran and Hadith, which are the sayings of uh, Muhammad and acts of Muhammad on waging war in Islam. It must be a war of defense. 
It must not take the lives of innocent people. The Islamists hijacking Islam twist the Quran and Hadith to the point that the good in Islam is evil and the evil is good. This is not a war between Christianity and Islam. How should Latter-day Saints view this war on terror? One month after the September 11th attack, President Hinckley said, those of us who are American citizens stand solidly with the president of our nation. The terrible forces of evil must be confronted and held accountable for their actions. We value our Muslim, excuse me, this is not a matter of Christian against Muslim. We value our Muslim neighbors across the world and hope that those who live by the tenets of their faith will not suffer. I ask particularly that our own people do not become a party in any way to the persecution of the innocent. Rather, let us be friendly and helpful, protective and supportive. It is the terrorist organizations that must be ferreted out and brought down. This statement was given after President Hinckley was handed a note saying the bombing of Afghanistan had just begun. The scriptures are very specific that an important component of a just war is that it be a defensive war. To me, Afghanistan was a defensive war. As a Latter-day Saint, I am now somewhat confused as to where this war is heading. I'm not saying it is totally wrong, but I don't feel that it's totally right either. Can we take the defensive posture too far? This is what bin Laden does to justify his war against the West. The US military presence on Saudi soil, our payment of taxes to support the military, our very election process, our corrupt society, all threaten Islam, according to bin Laden. Therefore, his war is a defensive war. I cannot find this kind of thinking supported in the scriptures. Just war against terror argues that the US, the most powerful nation in the world, should be the leader in the war against terrorism. This brings up all sorts of other questions I hope will be addressed here. However, in making this a just war, I hope it will also be a smart war. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate what Sally and Brian have, have uh, said, um, and each of us is taking kind of a, a different cut at the book by Elstein. Um, I'd like to emphasize um, and focus my remarks on areas of agreement and disagreement that Elstein would have with uh, LDS theology. And what's being passed out here is actually, um, um, I guess it's the cover of uh, a new book that's coming out um, that shows that there's a very lively tradition of discussion among LDS national security uh, professionals and scholars um, that um, if you were not aware of that, I hope you will become aware of it because I think it's a very important trend since many of our, uh, the members of our national security establishment are in fact LDS. Okay, the first point that uh, Elstein makes that I think LDS theology would be completely in agreement with is that evil is not reasonable. Evil is real and it is completely unreasonable. You cannot negotiate with evil. At its core, evil despises both life and freedom or agency. And this is consonant with what we know about the war in heaven and its aftermath. It wasn't a discussion in heaven. People didn't agree to disagree in heaven. Some were actually thrust out of heaven, never to be readmitted. That which accompanies evil are signs that we should be looking for um, in all public discourse as a way to judge it. Here are some of the things that accompany evil. Lies. Okay? For there to be good, there must be a ground of truth. Okay? So that in order for there to be evil, there must be lies. Second, she points out that one way of doing this is to make uh, inappropriate equivalences and twist words. One of the best examples of this is one that Corey cited, where people call martyrs not those who die for their religion, but those who kill others for their religion, and part of the collateral damages themselves. Okay. The twisting and redefining of words in unjust and inappropriate fashion accompanies evil. Third, complacence and inertia. Uh, one of the big um, tools with which evil works is to suggest to people that there's nothing that can be done. 
and that just going on the way that we have gone on is the best approach to the new threats that face us. Last, one, another of the hallmarks of things that accompany evil is that there's complicity with evil in refusing to see, refusing to judge righteous judgment, refusing to act, to confront evil and hold it accountable. Um, page 104, she also adds one last hallmark of evil. A willingness to sacrifice children is one sign of a culture of death. And I think that's another hallmark that we can look for. In a sense, then, the things that we must stand for and defend are things like truth, meaning, life, judgment, agency, love. These are the things that we must stand for if we're to confront evil. The second point that I think LDS theology really resonates with, she says, we underestimate the centrality of the gender question at our peril. On page 40, she gives this wonderful quote by Bernard Lewis that I think is very important here. The emancipation of women, more than any other single issue, is the touchstone of difference between modernization and westernization. The emancipation of women is westernization. Both for traditional conservatives and radical fundamentalists, it is neither necessary nor useful, but noxious, a betrayal of true Islamic values. It must be kept from entering the body of Islam, and where it is already entered, it must be ruthlessly excised. Now, I don't know if I agree with Bernard Lewis, because I've heard, I've heard a number of Islamic feminists talk about Islam in a very different way. But I think the family proclamation, which is an absolute jewel of a document that our church has put forth, makes it very plain that an important barometer of the health and trajectory of a society is the treatment of women. And when that treatment is oppressive, your society will suffer tangibly. Those societies that are against, at a very visceral level, the emancipation of women will suffer. And that's an important point that she makes, that uh, LDS theology can resonate with. Third, in speaking with, um, uh, about uh, comparing the Islamic principles with other principles, there are actually some principles in her um, analysis of uh, Islamic principles that maybe the LDS would con concur with. For example, we believe that a church and state synthesis might be possible. In fact, we're actually looking forward to the day when the king is our savior. But we also have historical examples from Nauvoo, uh, from the territory of Deseret, where church and state were purposefully intertwined. And so we do not believe that a strict separation of church and state is the only way to go. Second, in the LDS uh, community, we also believe that crime, defined secularly, has to be based upon a notion of sin. So to the extent that Islam believes that as well, I think uh, many people in the LDS community could agree. There are some things that the LDS community would disagree with. The, the government cannot wage war to spread religion. And second, um, the government must enshrine religious liberty. Even if church and state are intertwined, there must be freedom of conscience because that's what the war of heaven was all about. This is the day for us to choose. If nobody's letting you choose, you're defeating the divine purpose for your mortality. Um, with El Stein, um, I think church members would agree that the government must prevent anarchy and chaos and that American values enshrined in the Constitution belong to all humankind. And you can find evidence for those two points in the Doctrine and Covenants. Now, there is an LDS tradition of just war. Um, it is slightly different from many of the contemporary interpretations of just war theory. And in fact, in this book that's being published in about four weeks, it will exist, uh, you'll have some of um, the LDS community's premier thinkers on these issues articulate an LDS doctrine of just war. Here's some of uh, the components of that. Though the church is to renounce war and proclaim peace, we also believe as a people there are sacred obligations of self-defense at the personal and at the national level, as Sally alluded to. We believe that self-defense may actually extend to defense of an ally, and that's David O. McKay. We believe church members may honorably serve in the armed forces and may have the obligation to do so as part of the respect due to governmental authorities. We also believe governments are instituted by God to create a civic peace in which individuals and families may work out their salvation. 
We believe soldiers are not responsible for executing lawful orders and that servicemen have the obligation to refuse to, exercise, to execute unlawful orders. We believe that opposition to use of force must be expressed legally and in such a way as to not jeopardize the lives of soldiers. We believe we have the right to oppose not only those who seek our lives, but also tyrants that seek to deprive us of our liberty. We believe in raising the standard of peace first before resorting to war. We believe in conducting war in the most humane manner possible. For example, J. Reuben Clark, the first presidency at the time of the Hiroshima bombing, um, articulated um, a denunciation of that bombing. Though we do not believe God always takes sides in a conflict, for we're told that most wars are the wicked fighting the wicked, we do believe that those who follow these guidelines concerning war and its justification and conduct will receive more strength and that those who reject and trample these guidelines will receive no strength and may even be hindered by divine force. The occasion for war should always be an occasion for mourning. Um, I won't go into her characterization of uh, the life of Jesus Christ on page 99, except to say that we would probably differ tremendously as an LDS people from her view as, of Jesus as one who praised people who didn't marry or have children, and in giving the parable of the lilies of the field, was urging Christians not to uh, be engaged in temporal pursuits. I, I think that that um, is a, a foundation not worth building upon. There are several other points, some that are in harmony and some not, and I'll, I'll issue these quickly. Um, one of the most important for me, personally, is the issue of dirty hands that she discusses on page 113. She says, God's gift of forgiveness and mercy is available to those who, in acting against evil, themselves incur guilt. She says, God helps us find a way through our dilemmas, not out of our dilemmas. She says, we must believe in God's promises or we will be tempted to withdraw from the world in order to remain guiltless. She says, as Christians, we must not engage in wallowing or self-loathing. We must have the courage in introspection, in courage, in action, to do as President Hinckley said, to confront evil and hold it accountable. Uh, we are told, um, you may know that uh, we're told not to judge, but also to judge righteous judgment. Uh, there was a talk by Elder Dallin H. Oaks that I think speaks to this. And he says, none of us, none of us is entitled to make a final judgment on any person, but that we are enjoined by the Lord to make righteous intermediate judgments. Indeed, we must make righteous intermediate judgments in order to be an actor on the mortal stage. And I think that's something very important. She talks about four types of justice, retributive, uh, distributive, and restorative. I find echoes of those in LDS doctrine concerning justice and law, concerning Zion, and concerning repentance. So I think there's a lot of resonance there. She says we must look at religion to understand the trajectory of the world. I think we can all agree there. One last thing that I'm not sure that we can agree with is what she recalls the equal regard doctrine where she claims that the U.S. has the moral obligation to intervene in failed states and against tyrants wherever those exist. This is slightly problematic from an LDS point of view because we believe that respective agency demands that sometimes you let the tares grow, all right? And that peoples have the first right to overthrow their repressive rulers and work out their own destinies. We also believe that the transformation at the level of individuals and families through missionary activity can be much more powerful and long-lasting than transformation from the top down, though that is also important. But we can certainly think about how foreign policy can be moral, how we can develop a more moral foreign policy, such as not using food as a weapon, or issues concerning debt relief and so forth. Anyway, if you are inclined to join the National Security Dialogue with reference to LDS principles, I encourage you to do so. If you can pick up this book, pick it up. If not, give me an email and I'll tell you a listserv where people are discussing some of these issues. Thank you very much. Some of the others have come here with a portfolio. I come here without portfolio. Uh, I'm a Miltonist uh, and a literary critic. <laughs> Uh, it is true that Milton Studies has been engaged in this issue in uh, interesting ways in respect to Milton's work on Samson Agonistes, Samson as a terrorist who brings down the two towers in the name of God upon the Philistines. 
has raised some of the same ethical issues we see here. My, my, uh, as an, I believe, it, frankly, in amateurism, uh, in the same way that Hugh Nibley did, that that's really what we should all be about, loving learning. Uh, and I want to just, I want to just come as an outsider uh, to try to explain um, that something that I know, some things I understand about the just war tradition, a little analysis of the book, and then the LDS theology. So I'll talk about those three issues really quickly. What is the Christian just war theory all about? Uh, J, uh, Elshin's book, what's my take on it, summary, I won't do too much of that because it's been done, and then a bit of my own personal and LDS response to that. First of all, the just war theory is, is an intellectual tradition, and Elshin wishes that those sorts of intellectual resources had, could be brought to bear more fully on the conversation, national dialogue and international dialogue about war. It's a conversation that goes back in particular to Augustine. Um, and um, you can see that Elshin is herself an Augustinian in many ways, at least two. One is she is kind of, she believes in human uh, 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 fallibility and original sin. Humans are, we would call it, there's the natural man. She believes that we are fundamentally in need of restraint because of our evil natures. And these are non-negotiable. She is also an Augustinian in the sense she goes back to this intellectual tradition of just war theory. It goes from Augustine through the Middle Ages. Aquinas is another important figure. Uh, the Protestants, Luther, Grotius in the 17th century, a uh, person I've read in connection again with my Milton studies, modern people like Tillich and Niebuhr. Uh, uh, she doesn't do as much with it as she should and could, but the Catholic statement, the bishop's letter, American bishop's letter on war is in, worth reading, important document. And uh, the, the Catholic catechism that was influenced by John Paul II to people like Elston. And there's a number of books. And it's worth reading some of that material. What I find interesting about this, this is uh, an analysis that looks at war grounded in the second commandment. To me, this is where my own thinking has gone for a number of years. How can we understand war in connection with the commandment to love our neighbor? Um, what is our duty toward our neighbor? Uh, is it the same that we have toward ourselves? Augustine suggests that Christians may have a response, a moral responsibility to not respond to harm by harming others, not respond evil to evil. But, but Christians, especially if you're in the position of a magistrate or in a state, you have a, a moral obligation to restrain evil so that out of the second commandment of loving, of loving neighbor uh, devolves a responsibility to prevent evil. This is uh, outlined briefly in her letter. In fact, the, the letter that she and other intellectuals wrote, uh, I don't know if I have time to read it. I won't. I'll just summarize. I just want to summarize. But that's, that's the issue. And it's one that's fascinated me for a long time, is how a warfare can be a response uh, to the commandment to love evil when we have this other, other commandment not to do harm, not to respond to evil with evil. There are two parts to the just war theory, traditionally in Christianity especially, and that's the jus ad bellum, which is, the, that is, the causes for war and the Jews in bello, that is, how we conduct our war. That, this, those are just Latin phrases for when should we go to war, the ad bellum arguments, when, in order to go to war, what's necessary to be just. That's the Latin ad bellum. And in bello, in, during the conduct of war, how should it be con conducted for it to be a just war? In the ad bellum arguments, some of those, you might not get this impression when you read her book, have been used historically to restrain states in the way they when and, and how they go to war. The just war is often used to restrain against, so, so there's a presumption against wars in the Christian tradition, Christian tradition of aggression, ag aggrandizement, vengeance, and national honor, and other reasons. When it's justifiable is when it's done by a legal, she mentions these, these in the book, legal authority, openly, openly uh, uh, open decision by legal authority, response to aggression against one's own people or against innocent third parties, done with right intentions without hatred, and done as a last resort. She also adds a fifth one, which sometimes comes into these discussions. It may be done sometimes for prudential reasons, that is, prudential arguments, like w is, there a great, is there a likelihood of success? The in bello arguments, that is, how you conduct war, she basically focuses on two, proportionality, questions of proportionality. The war has to be response to grievous evil of a serious nature, not to minor infractions. And discrimination, that is, you have to distinguish between, say, combatants and non-combatants, which terrorism doesn't. 
just brief. So that's just a really quick thing about just war theory from a from the classical tradition, going back to Augustine and through. Those are some of the issues, and you'll find them in the book. Elstein, uh, let me just, uh, the context of the book has been mentioned. It's, it's 9-11. It's written before the war in Iraq, unfortunately. Uh, so she doesn't deal with some issues I wish she would. If you can't read the book before she comes, I'd read her letter, the letter from those intellectuals. It's, it's on the web, but it's also in the, the, the appendix to the book. And it's only a, f a few pages, and it will at least introduce you to the dialogue. Um, the limitations of this book, in my view. I'll mention sometime later my disagreements with the book, but here are some things that aren't in it. I wish it had more discussion, uh, and it, the title suggests it, it would, of the unique nature of terrorism. I alluded to this briefly. This is not fighting a nation state. And I think that there's a blurring of, of the issue of the combatant and non-combatant that terrorism raises that she, I wish she'd talked about. Uh, it's partly an ideology that says we're going to kill civilians. And when she uses, she defines terrorism as random murder of innocent people, the response to murder is usually a police action. It's putting people in jail, not a war. You don't go to war against a murderer. So we have to think through the kinds of issues that terrorism particularly raises in the just war theory. And she, she does that partly, but I wish she'd engage that more fully. Um, it, if it's a war on terrorism, it's also then a war on ideology, uh, the ideology that says uh, random killing is, is, is OK. Therefore, it's not just about guns. It's got to be about hearts and minds and words and ideas. And uh, sometimes I, worry that the, I wish the Bush administration would think about that a little more thoroughly. I wish it dealt with the Bush doctrine of pre preemption, which is a, one that causes me great concern, uh, the doctrine of preemption. And I wish it had dealt with Iraq, even if it had written just an appendix on the Iraqi situation. Some of the strengths of the books, as I see it, I like the Augustinian tough-mindedness. Politics is not the nursery, said Hannah Arendt. And she kind of, uh, Elshin begins with that kind of, men can be evil, they cannot be talked out of it. And civil society depends on the forcible restraint of evil, whether it's by police or by, by military, internationally or domestically. I like that. I think that, she's, she's, she, that she calls attention to that. I like her attention to language as an English professor, uh, careful definitions, and knowing that definitions, that policy and moral, dis moral discussions, good moral discussions flow from careful definitions, the difference between we've heard already between murderers and, and, and terrorists and so forth. Uh, I also like the challenge that the book has to the academy and to the pulpit to re and how they responded to evil. Uh, we tend to in, in the academy, we tend to prefer liberal talking solutions to things. We're going to talk people out of it. That, that assumes rationality. And by Corley, our academy, academy is secularized, and so we tend to dismiss religious me, re, reasons for actions. And she takes terrorists for their word and tries to focus on religious motives, skewers those who don't. Uh, this can be bracing. I like the question of the responsibility of power. Uh, what is our responsibility for power? What, if, if you see something evil happening as an individual, do you have a, and you're more powerful, do you have an obligation for restraint? Does that same ethic apply to nations, or are there differences between individuals and nations in this? Should nations sometimes, individuals, if individuals should sometimes choose to suffer harm rather than uh, inflict it, should nations uh, ever choose to suffer uh, assault? The weaknesses of the book, as I see it, I like what she opposes better than what she proposes sometimes. I'm especially concerned about, in page 166, her argument that you've alluded to of a return to imperialism, the burden to protect failed states, to impose a kind of equal justice. I think that there are some real issues there that she should talk about. In one of her criticisms that by Stanley Hauerwas, a Duke theology professor, he, was, he also raised some questions there, and she responded rather angrily to them. But I think I had similar concerns. I don't know where she's going and how far she goes on that argument that we have an obligation to um, impose American values when we see people suffering. How far does that go? Um, I, she disses uh, pacifism in the book. And it's a kind of utopianism. And I think that from an Augustinian point of view, she's right and wrong. From my point of view, pacifism has two important positives. I'm not a pacifist. I, I think I thought of this a lot. I think if I'd been in a Dietrich Bonhoeffer situation where you had the 
opportunity and the possibility of, ex of assassinating Hitler and maybe bringing an end to the war, I probably would have been joined the conspiracy. Nevertheless, um, pacifists, to me, have these two functions. One is they serve as a moral conscience to society. I think they're important that way often. We, we, uh, they, they're bracing for me, uh, pacifists, and what some people have called, like how are us, functional pacifists. They cause us to re reflect. And the other thing is, she doesn't seem to give enough credit to this, in my view. Nonviolence has sometimes worked, even in a real world of, of politics. Gandhi, Martin Luther King, the anti Nihai Lehi's. Uh, it sometimes changed hearts at some point. Now, just quickly to end, a personal perspective, an LDS perspective on just war theory. Uh, my ethics, both uh, international and personal, is grounded in my theology, my deep conviction. And in my, my the, the primary point of my theology and my ethics is the brotherhood, sisterhood of the human family. I remember saying this to my children right after 9-11 something I wrote as well in my journal. All war is in some ways civil war, just as all murder is in some ways fratricide. Cain and Abel uh, are the first murder, but they are also every murder. When we kill others, we kill our brothers and sisters. When we engage in warfare, we're always engaging with our brothers and sisters. In spite, even with, even, and we have to remember that with the nation states, that these different nationalities are at the deepest level and so God weeps over warfare because it's tragic that his children are fighting, as Enoch said, we see in Enoch, and as President Hinckley said, that, uh, this is a cause for uh, weeping in heaven. I find just warfare theory helpful, nevertheless, in, in, in I find it helpful in reaching out from a non, to others because it provides a non-LDS way of engaging a common cause to restrain evil, uh, and, and in how to prosecute war. I agree that the love of neighbor requires force, police, court, military. Uh, but in my personal life, it's, it seems to me when I deal with others, Sally, on an individual level, usually ironic responses, pa peaceful responses, sometimes absorbing the harm and injury and insult are ways to move forward more than responses in kind. To me, the history of Israel's response to Pal Palestinians shows some of the tragic consequences of eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. The L now, what would LDS theology, I'm interested in this book, I didn't know about it, what would it contribute to Christian just war theory? For me, it contributes to at least these things. One is the idea of forbearance, that we do need to bear patiently, according to section 98, the most important section on just war theory for LDS. Bear patience patiently, even suffer up to, it says three times, you have to suffer some evil. It, it suggests that, for at least the way I read it, that there's a primacy not of self-defense, but of third parties, the protection of families and children, are even more important reasons to go to war than your own injury. It suggests raising the standard of peace, which to me is, has a more positive obligation upon us than last resort theory, uh, that we should all along be negotiating for peaceful solutions, which means political solutions, it implies, and this is important, an obligation for repentance on the part of those going into warfare. You should read Third Nephi, I mean um, Moroni chapter 3 or other ones, where the people go going to fight always have to repent and become righteous. We might, I might also add some other qualifications that I'm not sure LDS to the list of just war, reason, just war principles that she adds. One is, in bellow arguments, I think that we just we ought to respect safe haven, safe passages. There ought to be in, another principle that could be added to just war theory is respect for the environment. Um, another one is uh, just wars ought to respect the sanctity of life. There's a principle that it's better to risk your own life than the life than, than the compa enemy combatant, combatants. What if we thought about that? I, I think this is one of the problems with Clinton's war in in. Um, uh, former Yugoslavia, you protect military life, but do you, do you care just as equally, again, in this doctrine of the brotherhood of man for the enemy combatants? And this is the principle I like. The just wars are aimed not at the past. They're not about revenge, but about the future. They're about securing liberty. Thanks. Okay, we realize some of you may have to break for classes. We'd like to go a little bit longer. We're scheduled to go till 1230. Um, I'd like to give an opportunity for the panel to respond to one another and uh, then see 
We have some time to go to some questions from the audience. Any of you like to take the floor? I'm noticing our age, and um, I'm wondering how you all feel about um, your automatic instinctual or visceral responses. I'm thinking about when I was in college and um, the Vietnam War, and just the word war puts a pit in my stomach, and a man in uniform puts a pit in my stomach, and it's so, it goes back to Kent State and um, Vietnam. I'm just wondering if you guys are my age. One of the things I like about the book is she kind of confronts us as academics, especially with our kind of instinctive self, the self-loathing about uh, as, uh, about America or intellectual, or uh, and also with the kind of instinctive sense that that peace at all costs is always preferable. She, in addition to defining other things, she also tries to make us think about peace more realistically. Peace is not just the absence of war. The people who were suffering under the Taliban or under different regimes may not feel that they're in a state of peace. She raises, she's been very influenced by Vaclav Havel, uh, the Czech, uh, and, and she, she talks about uh, his response to kind of peaceniks. And so the reason, that one of the things I like about it is I do think that some of us who are children of the 60s and grew up with that, as I, I did, um, need to kind of correct I, that in our own soul to not mm -hmm. always respond viscerally and instinctively but recognize some place for war. That's not working either. Any comments? Let's open up to questions. Questions from the audience? If uh, we just need to repeat the question here, if we could. No, what I meant, what the reason I did that is just in case the audience didn't know what original sin meant. And the closest that we come in the Latter-day Saint tradition, I think, is a doctrine of, of the, the, the natural man, that there's something kind of rooted in us that has um, in a, in our, a fallen nature. But no, I don't. I, I obviously, obviously believes that children are, are born evil. In fact, I remember one of my sh a shocking experience in graduate school when I was studying Latin was reading in Latin uh, something Augustine has to say about babies. And he says, he, I was reading this a lot, and he says, well, the baby is grabbing and wants all, it, it wants everything, and it cries for everything, and it's angry if it doesn't get its way. And if that were an adult, would say, that person is evil and awful, and we should say the same thing about infants. <laughs> and I was kind of, you know, that, well, here it is. I hadn't, you know, read it first <laughs> in the original language before. But no, I don't, I don't believe, but I, I think that, so I was just trying to draw that comparison because I think it's as close as we get. Something about natural, uh, the, the, the natural man. We are, you know, um, uh, what is it? So, uh, carnal, fleshly, mm -hmm. selfish, devilish. devilish. That's for you uh, to try to help us define in the college of religious ed. I think. Matt. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say I've always wanted to be at a panel where Sally Bar was introduced. <laughs> hey, you know, you and me are in the middle. That's good. Uh, Touche. Uh, I think this is uh, perhaps for John, but maybe others want to respond too. I, I have not read the book yet. I will for next week. But I'm interested about this challenge that she throws out to the academy and to quote the pulpit of the book. Because um, I think that's that.
there anything in Elstream's challenge that uh, we need to think about from a church perspective? You know, the reason I just did a double take, Matt, is first, I couldn't remember what you're talking about with Brian. I thought you were talking about President Hinckley's case. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> and but President the, Hinckley's speech is interesting, by the way, because oh. he, he was very careful oh. in that speech. He always, he said, it is, he said repeatedly, it's my belief. He never right. sort of came out and spoke and another, you know, very interesting address is, of course, the address in the conference about uh, the Iraq War by yeah. Mr. Hinckley. And um, one of the contributors to this volume who was doing an exegesis of it found, on the one hand, on the other hand, on the third hand, on the fourth hand, on the fifth hand, on the sixth hand, you know, um, someone who was an LDS pacifist would find things in there that they would like. Someone who viewed themselves as an LDS hawk would find things in there that they liked. But in, in, in a sense, I, I, I look at that speech as a, as a masterful exposition of the idea that the mortal world is fraught with moral peril, right? That there are plenty of on the one hand and on the other hand and caveats to be made. Uh, and that this isn't a simple black and white issue and that the more nuanced we can be, the more we can be wise as serpents but harmless as doves, which is what we're aiming for. Sorry, is what did I go off? Fair game for sacrificing talk. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is fair game? What do you mean by what? What, uh, what, is? Right, what was the example you used, right, uh, where you said Nazis? The Nazis. Yeah, but there, yeah. there was some discussion of Islam and in the context of the war. And, uh, I, I don't know how many of you have heard uh, a Sunday school lesson where. Islam is brought up as the anti-type of all things, the anti-Christ even of things. Uh, but it's happened. It, it happens now more than it ever has before. I mean, I've been in some high priest group lessons that just uh, make my hair stand on end. Uh, from what I'm hearing, it's so it's so ignorant. It's it's not even funny. Kind of become Relief Society. I don't recall us yeah. ever talking. Yeah, go to Relief Society. <laughs> I want to go to Relief Society. <laughs> I guess uh, they weren't following the manual. <laughs> That's right. They were not following the manual. That's exactly right. <laughs> there is a just one one response to that. It seems to me that one thing we can do as individuals is um, is, is is affirm something that is universal, and that is that however we're engaged politically as with enemies, there is never there's not never been rescinded the the commandment to love our enemies. In, in, in a journal article, I mean, in my own diary or journal that I wrote afterward, I, 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 I thought I better write it because I wanted to have my immediate reaction. Not a good, but I talked. I, I went to a neighbor who is um, a Mus Muslim, and I asked. This was on the 16th of October. I said, um, "How are th how are things going?" And I asked if there's been any uh, pers uh, hatred or persecution. And, and then in the journal, I, I say there have been all these calls for retribution. Um, all these events have led me to wonder about the morality of war from a Christian perspective. It seems quite clear that on a personal level, hatred and retribution are condemned. Christ is an example of not reviling when reviled. I'm not sure an, if nations are, have the same ethic. But the question is, but there is ne there's never been a recension about loving our enemies. So I, I don't think however you define just war, and I think that's one thing you can do with neighbors and over the pulpit that doesn't get into the politics so much as our own personal interactions with other human beings. Other questions? Yes. I'm just wondering, isn't uh, Islam's practice uh, basically agency and freedom of your mind? In other words, if you're a Muslim, do you have the freedom to depart from that? And uh, does that present some problems? Depart from what? The yeah, convert pay to Christianity. Well, we all know that conversion is a problem. Uh, conversion to Christianity or any other religion is a problem in, in Islam. Uh, 
But if I understand you correctly, you're asking, is there any agency in Islam? Is that what I'm hearing? Well, within Islam, there's lots of agency. I mean, there's plenty of latitude for belief. It depends on where you're at, though. If you're a member of the Taliban, okay, your agency is going to be much more restricted than if you're maybe in a much more moderate country, Islamic country. It just depends on where you're at. And so the question is kind of like nailing jello to a wall here. You can't – it's really difficult to pin it down. As I mentioned earlier, you know, with 1.2 billion Muslims in the world, I mean, we need to make friends, don't we? That's a lot of people. That is a lot of people to make mad at us. You know what I'm saying? You know, we need to learn how to work with them. We need to learn how to build bridges. We need to learn how to understand them better and where they're coming from and build those bridges. Now, with terrorists, of course you can't. El Stain is very good at it. You can't talk to them. They're not reasonable. You can't reason with them. But I know lots of Muslims you can reason with, okay? I know lots of them that would probably agree with a lot of what she's saying here. And so there's some latitude for belief there, certainly. An agency is there, depending on where you're at, of course. Does that kind of make sense, sort of? Brian, you mentioned this in your paper or your response, that there may be some disappointment in the moderate Muslims didn't rise up. I was struck by the examples, the hypotheticals she gives to illustrate that. Not only the – she talks about the Crusades and says, you know, it doesn't make – it wouldn't make a lot of sense if Christians were to justify some sort of a terrorist action on the basis of a medieval injustice. But she said if a fundamentalist Christian had flown a plane into the holy sites of Mecca – remember that hypothetical? The whole Christian world would have – the whole Western world would have risen up in condemnation. Where are Muslim moderates rising up in condemnation? Well, you know, there's a big difference between the World Trade Center and Mecca. I mean, that is so holy to them. I mean, to me, it's an extreme – it's kind of a very disproportionate example to me because – Yeah, I thought about that, although if you're looking for, in a secular nation, symbols, especially the – if one of the planes might have been aimed at the White House, for our secular symbols, there aren't many more you could find that are more – That's true. For a secular symbol, I think it's very good in that way, yeah. But you're right. You know, there would be an outcry on that, certainly. Absolutely there would be. For me, the reason I ask that is I do think she kind of downplays the, you know, the asymmetry between the West and Islamic states. There's been a – it's a little harder for them to respond because of that. Well, I don't think she downplays it. I think she just refers to Bernard Lewis's book, saying, you know, read this, and you'll see how different they are. And then she doesn't talk about it enough. Right. What went wrong, that book. It's mostly that book, yeah. I happened to read a couple months ago. Yeah, that's right. I have a question for you, panel members. At least, John, maybe I'm opening a can of worms here, but should I open up the Iraq can of worms? You know, where are you at with that, John? Because you alluded to it, and I'd like to hear the other panel members on that. Well, I did allude to my concern about the doctrine of preemption. It seems to me in 3 Nephi chapter 3, verse 20, there's a – you could interpret that as an injunction against preemption, that, again, there's this sense that you need to suffer. You suffer harm in Section 98 rather than inflict it first. We've seen that the doctrine of preemption is – one of the dangers of it, even if you think it's justifiable cause of war, is it needs to be – your information needs to be very secure. That's been a problem. So I wish that she were here to – I think as far as the Iraq war is concerned, it does seem to me like 
there's there's some differences in it and what and the Taliban is his own enemy. I I uh, also feel like there's a, a huge issue in the Bush administration not talking about the cost of that war, the long term, the, the high probability of long term need to stay there and, and what it would take to do, do nation building in that state. My position was pretty pretty much Thomas Friedman's position before the war. Uh, there was some hope, there's some possibility of hope that this may rearrange the, uh, the, the situation in the Middle East, but there's a strong possibility of disaster too. This is actually uh, occupied a number of the chapters in this book that's coming out, and it was the issue that uh, it most divided the CLDS scholars who were writing about preemption. Actually, the scripture quoted by those who were against preemption was found in Mormons 4.4. Yeah. And take a look at that one. That's uh, not going up against your enemy. And, and 3.9, when, when they decide to do that, that's when Mormon says, I will no longer fight with you. Mm -hmm. And they decide to go up against them and, to, and when they take a vow, a swear a vow of blood but revenge. But there is equally, there is, a, there is a different point of view, and the different point of view is that the preemption was completely justified, that Iraq, though, may be seen as a special case, uh, looking at the violations of the UN resolutions, the inadequacy of the response of the Clinton administration, and uh, perhaps unfortunately, though the jury is still technically out, uh, faulty intelligence, right? All of those things make Iraq, I think, a very interesting case because we do have demonstration of prior use of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, we had evidence of uh, kicking out inspectors. We had evidence of, of uh, that we thought indicated an imminent threat. And um, so uh, my point of view, which was shared by some of the contributors to the volume, was that in this particular instance, preemption could be justified um, even on the basis of LDS theology about these things. You know, it's one thing to talk about not going up against your enemy when your enemy has to come to your land to kill you and your women and children. It's quite another thing when we're talking about an enemy who can bring in vials of smallpox or even have people infected with smallpox, send them to your country, just have them cough a lot, you know? I mean, <laughs> or an ICBM with, uh, with nuclear warheads. When you're talking about that, and I, I really do think that you're into a new set of circumstances in which, using Sally's terms, we have to renegotiate what the lessons of the Book of Mormon are for us. If Moroni had lived now, what would he constitute? Going up against your enemies as versus being prudential and, and forestalling an attack that could, it doesn't just wipe out your soldiers, it wipes out every living thing. And that may include animals as well. You know, uh, without life, that there, there's an interesting controversy and I hope when you see the book you'll, you'll read the different points of view. And oh, well, I, I, I'm just a hopeless idealist and I, would want, I wish we had taken, and I don't like George Bush, but I wish we had taken <laughs> all the money that they spent on the Afghan and the Iraq war and um, trained uh, two million Ammons uh, <laughs> to speak their language and gave them uh, books of education and then they just sort of m moved into their land and promised as Ammon did to the king Lamoni, I will I will stay, I will, you know, I just love Ammon because I am most impacted by the fact that a fifth of the Islam nations, a fifth are illiterate. I, I'm just stunned by that. Of course that's what Elstein calls the talking response, the liberals tend to have. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I mean, we want to, we, we believe in education and reform, and li liberals do, liberal democracies. It's also very psychological. I really, really believe in the it, individual. It, it yeah, it is psychological. It seems to me that there's another, another thing you could say about that conflict uh, that, that moves it from to a different level than the, than the prevention of attack of, foreign, uh, of, of foreigners against us, which I thought blurred the distinction between the Baathist anti, uh, a secularist regime and the Al-Qaeda fundamental Islamicist regime in a way that the American people really didn't quite understand. I mean, it wasn't that, I don't know if the Bush administration did that explicitly, I don't know their, but I think a lot of Americans did. 
so in fact, there's this one person who writes about just war who said, who, who quotes a, a sergeant who was giving instruction to his men, and he said, and he was from New York, and he said, this is for the two towers when they were going after the Iraqis, and not knowing that the Al Qaeda people hated <laughs> Saddam Hussein, and now Saddam Hussein is <coughs> more Muslims than most. Of them. But anyway, you could have talked about that war more in terms of humanitarian intervention because um, there, there was, there has been suffering on a massive scale again on the argument that all, all people are God's children uh, by that regime uh, when we had, when we uh, when after Germany we hadn't been directly attacked but Germany was involved also in an evil regime you'd have to talk about it a little bit more that way, if, if, if the administration had done that, it might have a little more moral capital in which to talk, use now and say, we didn't, it wasn't just weapons of mass destruction, there was, there was something going on there, it was a liberation of, uh, also, but then you raised, the reason we didn't, I think, is because we were doing it through the UN, and you were trying to justify the war on a very narrow grounds that were, work with, but then you raised all those issues that both, uh, both of us talked about in the, on the intervention that that uh, for for failed regimes against failed regimes. Interesting, Cam. Um, Boyd, do you still have a question? Okay. Any other questions, comments? Yes. I'm just wondering about your two million animals. Uh, if they had been available and if we had trained them, how many of them would have been allowed into these countries? Amin was pretty smart. That absolutely. Now I can't help but notice, as a small group researcher, that the only questions have been that was the first question addressed to me, and the only all of you asked questions of the two men. And it, and it, in this setting where we really value equality, um, it, we still have that happening, and it, it, it's an amazing thing to think about a setting where women wouldn't even be here. They wouldn't even be here. They would be excluded. So I'm, I'm just thinking about the forces of our cultures. Again, that depends on where you're at. <laughs> well, we're here. We're, we're here, here, and, and me and, and Valerie are sitting here. North, North American Muslims, they can do this. You know, there's a lot of great uh, researchers out there and, and do the, the very thing that we're doing. Uh, sisters, too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I, I agree with your Ammon thing. Uh, I'd like to, s but I'd like to see more uh, disarming. Yeah. You know, Ammon going off and cutting off the arms. <laughs> 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 that, well, that worked too, didn't it?
Thank you for that comment. Ben, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, in response to Professor Barlow's accusation against our bias in the community, this question is directed at you. I'm just kidding. I know you're not biased. I'm not biased. <laughs> I, you didn't hear that. But uh, I just want Dr. Hudson and Professor Barlow to respond to this. Um, well, I'm not really asking you a question, but just if you're a woman, and I don't want to see my name on but... <laughs> It's work, isn't it? It's just work. We have to do it with each other. Kind of proves your point. Well, that, that's just that's just so we can look at it. So you, my question is, how you you use the word hopeless when you call yourself for your um, ideology? Um, it's that you, but that you didn't want war to be fought. But I was wondering how that how you, how as an everyday individual you can. I'm not going to, I'm not accusing my own church, yeah. but how you can justify that as an, a member of, of this church, being that the prophet is in his war, in his war speech that will not go away until Christ comes again. Yeah. And, and, and inaction by past presidents and administrations may have brought about the current situation. How Absolutely. Can, I just don't, it doesn't make any sense to me. And I just wanted to hear your response. I, I was just admitting the bedrock or the instinctual response I have to the notion of war. And I have to note that. So I um, had to go to the Book of Mormon and remind myself that there are times when there are just wars. So I was just trying to deal with my own sort of midbrain. Um, it, it does, it's also interesting in the Book of Mormon where in, in those passages um, they are told to go to war and not to be angry. Now that strikes me as a very difficult thing to do, and um, our military is trained in such ways that we get them to see the enemy as objects, and all of military um, advancements are based on the enemy as an object, an it. Here we have Moroni saying, "You can't, you can't hate." You, so how are we going to do that? Oh, yeah, and the other thing is, all, I believe all this stuff is kind of a dialectical tension, that we just have to tolerate the tension of the pacifist and the just war person inside of us. I don't know if you were asking me, but I'm a hopeful realist. In fact, I've often thought, and this is a very sexist remark, that men are on the planet to understand the value of mercy, but women are on the planet to understand the value of justice. Through the experiences of my life, I have found that even though I started out my life as a very serene, wallflower type of person, God has given me the experiences to metamorphose into something other than that. And that was be because he put me in situations where I did have to stand up to what I thought was illegitimate behavior, abusive behavior. I, at the beginning, I couldn't stand up for myself. It was when I became a mother and I had to stand up for my innocent children, that it transformed me into someone who sees the value of law and justice and accountability. And, and now, I don't know how to say it. I, I don't have any problem with force. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it is very true that you must be coming from a place in your heart that says, I love the innocent. I love truth. I love the correct meaning of words, right? If you come from the love of those things and stand up as an act of love, then you're okay. If you've defined standing up in terms of, oh, this is horrible, I need to squash it, I need to get these people out of the way, God will not prosper you, you will become bitter, it isn't going to end well, okay? But all your life, you will be dealing with people and you will disagree, and there will be politics, and there will be conflict. You know, uh, it, it's not all serene, and it kind of wasn't meant to be, I guess. There, there is reason that we need to stand up, even if that means that we may cause some conflict. How's that? I appreciate both of you. Thank you.
Thanks for the question. You know, I thought of something, Corey. Here we have Jean Elstein coming here to give to us. But we have something to give to her. I challenge the members of this panel to write up an LDS response to her book and to give her something to think about from the LDS community, from the LDS perspective. Hmm? Can we do something like that? Sounds like a good idea to me. More work. <laughs> Well, I'd like to end on this note. Any, any final comments from the panel? Any? You've been great. Yeah, our, numbers, our numbers have diminished, but I would just like to thank the panelists for their serious preparation, for their honesty and openness, for what I think has been a very far-reaching and very uh, fascinating discussion. I hope that you will come uh, better prepared for the lecture next week and that you will uh, be able to take advantage of this unique opportunity. Thank you very much.